It seemed that during the global pandemic, we started to lean on technology more. We leaned on human connection, physical human connection less. And I think that's taken its toll on people and on our organizations. Welcome to Tech Talks, the podcast brought to you by Nash Squared and hosted by myself, David Savage, that's been bringing you the latest thinking from technology leaders for over eight years. Welcome to today's edition of the podcast. Uh, This week, I am in South France helping my mum and dad renovate a property that they are moving into in the autumn and therefore on holiday. That means I'm not joined by either Akish or Amber this week, and it's a short intro, but we've still got two great interviews to bring you. We've been talking to Rupal Shah Hollenbeck, the president of Checkpoint Software Technologies, and Todd Olson, the CEO and founder of Pendo. And if you were listening last week, you'll know that this is the second part of our catch-up or recap, I suppose, of the collision conference that took place in Toronto a couple of weeks ago. So both of these interviews were recorded on the floor, or rather in the media village, in the in the podcast booths, but you will hear some background noise from the conference. What's coming up? Well, first of all, Rupal's talking about what leaders need to be focused on, which, to be perfectly honest, has a lot less to do with technology and a lot more to do with people. It's very much a case of people first, process second, and technology third. And then when we're talking to Todd later on in the show, He's asking himself, well, what questions am I getting asked? What are the audience interested to hear? What ideas are people taking away? And again, it's got to do with the fact that technology needs to solve real problems for people. Yet the way that we're interacting with it, the way that the interfaces are built might be changing, but is it solving problems? Anyway, that's what's coming up. We'll start with Rupal, second interview, Todd. Enjoy the show and we'll be back to our normal format next week. So I'm joined by Rupal. President of Checkpoint. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. How are you? Good, thank you. First time at Collision. Travelled up from uh, the West Coast and States to be here. That's right. Is it first time in Toronto? It's not first time in Toronto, but it's first time for business purposes in Toronto and first time at Collision, and it's been a fantastic combination. So you were talking on a panel this morning. I was. Do you want to just give us a little bit of context around what that panel was all about? Sure. I, you know, I was really excited about the topic, David, because it was about leadership in times of seismic change. And um, I think if you, if you think about where we are in the world um, and where we are in history, we are post the largest global pandemic. We are in the midst of geopolitical turmoil, to say the least. And we are in the midst of tremendous economic uncertainty. And when you put those, when you put those all together, um, leading in seismic change um, is right now. It's a current relevant topic. The world is incredibly volatile. And it's, I, I think it's quite difficult for leadership to necessarily know what to focus on or what the biggest threats are. How do you break that down? What should they be spending their time and attention on to actually make sure that their business is is being steered in the right direction yeah yeah it's a great it's a great question i think that for all of us leaders we're sort of dancing on our tippy toes right now and i I see that trend continuing if um you know the the few things that are really on my mind right now are um how we lead people through the times right now Uh, it seemed that during the global pandemic Uh, during the height of the global pandemic, we started to lean on technology more. We leaned on human connection, physical human connection less. And I think that's taken its toll on people and on our organizations. And so we're now headed into this new seismic change, which is what is the future of human connections? What is the future of the physical and the digital world? And how do we combine those? What is the new reality for people? That's number one. Number two is you can't sort of um, shake a stick without hearing generative AI. What does that really mean? How do we go from that being a buzzword for that being really meaningful for people and organizations? And how should leaders think about generative AI? And then the last is just the economic uncertainty. Um, For businesses to run profitably, it's not about growth at all costs anymore. It's about really responsible, rationalized investment. And I think that takes its toll um, on organizations of all sizes. So let's try and unpackage a couple of those those points. You mentioned there about investment. 
taking that point and your point about putting people first, how do, how do organizations practically do that? Because saying, hey, let's put people first is a very easy thing for an organization to say. In practice, certainly after the last few years that we've had, it might not be as easy in principle. You're absolutely right. And that's why I think it needs to, we need to, leaders have to push this all to the front of our brains. Um, and, and I think about the pecking order being people first, processes second, and technology third. Now, when we were all locked down in our homes, technology was our access to people and processes. That's all we had uh, alone, in our, alone in our homes. And so we have to turn that around and go back to people make the difference in any organization. The processes help those people maximize their productivity and maximize their output. And then the technology is the underpinning. The technology enables the processes that enable the people versus the other way around where we were so dependent on technology during the pandemic that we kind of forgot to be people first. And so leaders really need to rethink that and put people at the front. That is understanding what their needs are. You know, people talk about the great resignation. I don't believe in it. You know, a whole segment of the population didn't all of a, all of a sudden become independently wealthy, but I call it the great reset. It wasn't about a whole bunch of people resigning. Sure, people resigned, but people made different choices about their careers, about their livelihoods, about their families, and about themselves. And so this great reset has completely changed the workforce's expectation. And every organization is out to attract, retain, and develop the best talent they can find for their mission. And so coming back to that people first and people make the difference, really listening. As I said, David, we don't know what's gonna happen in the future. We don't know what the future of work really looks like. So anyone that tries to pinpoint it or have a hard policy on coming back to the office or working remote, I, I think they're premature. I think we have to listen, learn, and be agile enough to make changes as we go because the new reality hasn't set in yet. It's still early days. And that investment that you talked about then, what is that? That's, that's not necessarily on going out and hiring more people or, or throwing money at processes or you know it, there's a myriad of things where you you could point that money or point that 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 investment what's going to make the difference what actually tangibly gets people on side and and to uh, connect with their organizations first of all this is block and tackle work this is roll up your sleeves work this isn't a, a process that you launch it's not an email that you send it's about investment in the people. It means rethinking what onboarding is like for new talent. If we're gonna have hybrid onboarding, what does that really mean? And let's make sure that when physical connections happen, when live physical connections happen, that they're meaningful and high value for our employees. You can't take for granted an employee coming into the office anymore. So how do you make them productive in onboarding? How do you give them an experience that makes them feel a part of a culture? You can't build culture on a, on a video screen alone. It becomes a combination of the virtual, of the physical, and it's important for companies to invest in both. They, I personally do the same thing. I've invested, I travel, I visit teams, I expect our teams to get together, but then I also expect them to lengthen their productivity or expand their productivity by using the virtual world as well. I don't know what the right balance is, but I know as a leader I invest in both. There are companies who have shut down video conferencing and everybody's in the office five days a week. There are other companies that have said, we are fully remote. There will not be an office and we're divesting of all of our real estate. I don't know that either extreme is the right way to go for the future of human connections, but I'm willing to listen and learn from my employees and make changes as I need to. And those, those changes need to be functionally dependent and they need to be geography relevant. Now you've mentioned the word meaningful a couple of times. You mentioned it uh, specifically early on in reference to generative AI. I was um, moderating a panel in London a few weeks ago. One of the panelists asked in the room how many people have experimented with generative AI. Unsurprisingly, in a room of technology leaders, everyone put right. their hands up. And then they asked the question of the other panelists, how long do you think it will be before this is commercialized in a bigger way? And everyone had slightly different answers. Given that this is something that is difficult to predict, that is new, that is being used by lots of different people in different functionality 
within an organization in very individualistic ways, how do you make it meaningful to an organization as a whole? Yeah. Well, I, so David, I'm in the business of cybersecurity, so I, I, can, I can give you the perspective of, of my industry and where I sit. For Checkpoint, AI, um, we've been deep into AI since about 2012, 2013, when we started our Checkpoint Research Organization. And so we've used AI to be more predictive in service to our clients. Uh, of late, we've really accelerated the innovation cycle. And so for us, AI isn't a buzzword, and generative AI isn't something um, that we throw around um, without meaning. In fact, most people, I think, do throw it around without meaning because it makes them a part of a conversation. For us, AI fuels and informs every product development decision we make and our products themselves. They help our products be more predictive and more preventative. Right? When the bad guy is at the door, knocking on the door, the damage has already started. Just the knocking already has started the damage. We want, to, we want to stop them at the street before they ever get up to the house. That means prevention. That means good prediction. That means large data leaks. And it means being able to use AI in a very strategic and necessary way to deliver the best security to our clients. So without a doubt, our Checkpoint research team helps inform the best decisions and the best products. Um, and today we call, we, we call this engine Threat Cloud, Threat Cloud AI. And it operates on top of 41 different AI engines and growing by the, by the month. And we're, ve we're very proud of that. We can unequivocally show that generative AI and AI overall informs products. Here's the problem. Um, the bad guys aren't sitting around waiting. So, and it always, it just always seems like they're moving just that much faster. So the bad part of AI and increasingly generative AI as language models get bigger and bigger is that um, it democratizes hackers. If you think about it, anyone here at this conference could download ChatGPT and write malicious code, coder or not. I'm not a coder. I could go write malicious code. I could write a phishing email with ChatGPT as good as gold, more authentic than, than ever before. And our research has shown that. We've actually have people going in and creating malicious code with ChatGPT to see what would happen. And it works. And, um, and so those bad actors just seem to be moving that much faster. And so, so there's, you know, it accelerates good action, it accelerates bad action, which makes our development work even more important. And, you know, we celebrate 30 years um, this year. And what's, what's, what's interesting is that this is a place where legacy informs your future. We have one of the largest data lakes there is when it comes to cybersecurity. We have 30 years of data to be specific. We can use that to fuel the future and we've got more data than anybody else in cyber. And so it's our duty now to take that 30 years of data and translate it into the best products for the future. Um, and then the last thing I'll say about it is um, think about that, so that mandatory social media training you had to take 15 years ago, right? Where you went through a video and it showed you the do's and don'ts. Well, guess what organizations are gonna have to do now? They're gonna have to learn, grow, adapt, train and retrain employees. We don't wanna be in the position that some very large companies have been in lately where they've had to shut down ChatGPT inside the company because engineers were unintentionally, unintentionally um, sharing um, confidential information. And so some organizations have gone to the extreme. Others have said, have at it, because they haven't seen the negative effects yet. The right answer is probably somewhere in between, but training and retraining employees and staying educated and up to date on the latest is really important and it seems to change by the day. One final question. Sure. You've had a long day, so I don't want to keep you too long. <laughs> Look, you've been on panels. I'm sitting here asking you questions, but equally you're part of this community. What questions do you come to a conference like this wanting answers to? Yeah, so I, um, I am always fascinated by workplace policies, by leadership policies, and the way people have adapted and adjusted their leadership for their organizations and companies large and small. I come from a lot of mega companies in my past, 
companies like Oracle and Intel and now Checkpoint. I've also worked at one small AI startup in my career. And so I'm fascinated to learn from CEOs and C-suites up and down that spectrum um, on the way that they're managing their workplace for the future. I'm fascinated by both the challenges and the opportunities in generative. So I always ask what their policies are and what they're doing. Um, and I ask, especially um, IT professionals, I ask them what their biggest worry beats are. Um, I have the most um, to learn and the most new insight to gain um, when I ask people questions about their challenges and their problems. And so it's been a fascinating um, conference. And I think while opportunities, um, the opportunities that are in front of us, I think far outweigh the challenges, we have to tread carefully and keep lines of communication open. Well, look, thank you very much for your time. Enjoy the rest of your uh, stay at Collision. Thank you. So I'm chatting with Todd Olson, CEO and founder at Penda. You've just come off stage here at Collision, correct? How was the talk? The talk was good. I mean, look, I think a lot of the questions at this conference and in general right now in tech is around AI, generative AI, large language models. Uh, we were in a DevOps track, so it was trying to apply those principles to kind of devops like problems. So, um, so, yeah, I think it was a good conversation. Well, was it a panel? Was it a talk? It sounds like it was a panel. It was a panel. Yeah, I was myself as an operator alongside a venture capitalist. Uh, so I think it was interesting. You know, you know venture <laughs> capitalists came from a, a kind of a legal tech vertical SaaS kind of specialty area. It's a little bit different. You know, we... I know we tend to be completely horizontal. We work with every type of company, legal tax people, but but uh, uh, and software companies. But yeah, uh, yeah, it was interesting. So look, we've alluded a little bit there to the area that Pendo works in. Um, who are the business? What do you do? Yeah, so we help companies deliver better product experiences. And if you think about the way software, when I say software, or I say product, I mean software products. Think about software products have changed. Um, you know, I guess go back. Mark and Dreesen coined the software eating the world, we would contend it already ate the world, and it's affecting every aspect of how we live as consumers, um, from our banking applications to our healthcare applications to even more extreme examples like our coffee cups now have software applications associated with them. But it, our, think of our work life. We sit in front of a computer all day long. We context switch between, well, heck, it could be 50 applications, probably not one day, but within a month, certainly, uh, and how those applications work together, how easy they are to use. That to me is uh, the most interesting problem because I think a lot of the inefficiencies in our society have shifted from factory floors to software application and browser tabs. And how do we how do we measure that? How do we improve that? How do we deliver beautiful, great experiences in that context? So look, when you're going up on stage, as you just have, what do you think right now that audience in the auditorium are looking to hear from you? What do you think the learning is for them? Well, look, I think anytime you go to a conference, you want to be inspired and you want to hear things that either confirm something you were thinking before or challenge one of the ideas you were thinking. And I try to, I try to uh, answer within those two framings. What are some things that are more challenging and what are some things that are more confirmatory? Because, because actually you being told in an audience that you're right sometimes is honestly the confidence you needed to go execute in that idea. Like, no one wants to be alone in an idea, generally speaking. So, so I think... I think with those two areas, I, I try to be a little controversial, but at the same time, um, helpful um, in, in validating. You know, I think you know, at the end of the panel, we had this open ended conversation what's the future. I think, look, the challenge with AI is while it's hot, it's incredibly early. And like any of these uh, early adoption life cycles, as we've seen these before, um, there's a lot of hype. Uh, and. Um, then there's going to be, you know, there's going to be a divide between companies and technologies and solutions that are truly great and truly useful for ones that aren't. I think people don't know on which it is. In the interesting context, too, broadly in tech, you think about it, a year ago, everyone was talking about Web3 and crypto, and now no one is. Now, that, that doesn't mean that it's an invaluable technology. That doesn't mean that it's so overhyped. I just think that a year makes a big difference in tech. Now, a lot of us, myself included, don't think generative AI is going to be exactly the same because the hype for Web3, specifically around tokens, is too great for what it is, whereas the technology is actually a really good technology for decentralization. Um, uh, I think AI has broader applications. And we talked about in the, um, the panel was that 
this is to me an extension of the trend we talked about you know almost five ten years ago on big data and you see yep. the rise of the snowflakes and the data breaks and the company like that we just have a lot of data and the potential of that is untapped most companies have untapped it so look you say that that you either want to confirm someone's thinking or challenge it you're alluding to the fact that when you walk around the floor every single business now feels the need or the pressure to say we've got ai ai is part of our offering um what is the challenge for those businesses and and what do they need to be thinking about in terms of how they're deploying and using that technology well the question is does the ai solve a real problem you know are you just slapping up ai because you want someone to stop at your booth because the reality is the demand for ai is greater than anything else or do you actually apply AI to solve a meaningful problem. I think the number of companies you're seeing taking large language models, which are just an open API, and building features on it, which arguably don't solve a major problem. And when we think about technology, you know, think about startups, there's a lot of startups here. The first question we always ask a startup is, is this a painkiller or a vitamin? And I think a lot of the technology people are building on LLMs are vitamins. Oh, it's slightly better written text. Well, to be a startup and actually break away and be successful, you are you have to solve a problem, let's just say 10x better, maybe it's 7x, maybe it's 12x, I don't know, but roughly 10x better than conventional methods, like manual methods. And um, I think there's some applications, these large language models where we are, there's no way that, that 300 startups all figured out that <laughs> thing yet. Maybe they will, but I think, I think um, that's an interesting question. Now, there are problems that AI are creating, like privacy, and compliance, and governance. And people aren't even thinking about those things yet. They're just playing around with technology and things cool. I think it's going to be interesting to see which startups out there um, start solving really hard problems, which they can do a 10x better job on what exists or what's done manually. Like, that, to me, is going to be the interesting like shakeout from all this technology. It's going to take a few years. Certainly a few years ago when talking to startups, it was all about scalability, how fast you could grow. I think now in the challenging economic environment we found ourselves in, um, it's about scalability, but also efficiency. Do you think that the vast majority of founders out there have realized how AI could be a tool to help them on that efficiency journey? I think everyone's experimenting with how it can drive efficiency. You know, everything from, oh, wow, we need fewer developers because... Um, GitHub Copilot is going to generate all this code, or um, I don't need as many SDRs because we can have custom emails written from ChatGPT, or hey, we can have a chatbot which deflects some percentage of our support tickets. I think everyone's thinking about those technologies and playing around with it. Um, I think one of the challenges I have with it is there are existing incumbents in all of those markets. Everyone I mentioned actually has existing software technology writers, all of which are going to come up with their own application of AI at some point if they haven't already. And we tend to buy from the experts in certain spaces where I think a lot of people are just playing around with technology internally. The interesting thing would be, oh, when a lot of the traditional businesses have time to actually productize um, the technology well, that's when you're going to see some of the better efficiencies being realized internally. And us included, we help companies deliver a better product experience, and we're now applying AI to that problem. Um, some of that technology has been already we've been under uh, development for over a year, and is going to be released this year. Some is going to happen next year. Um, but I think I see it's our responsibility as a software vendor to take AI and apply it to our products, our data sets, to then make our customers 10x better for how they apply our product and how our product can then automate aspects of their jobs. If I return to the um, talk again, just for a moment, were there any questions or comments that, that surprised you? Anything that kind of stopped you and, and, and made you think during the course of that discussion, perhaps more than you'd expected to? Well, I think this question of the future is always an interesting one. You know, what? what you know, anytime anyone asks me to predict the future, it's always a very dangerous thing. I mean, you don't want to be wildly wrong. Um, one of the things I've been thinking about, and it's an interesting question, is is what's going to happen to all of our user interfaces? You know, Alexa came on, and 
I think a lot of us thought that, oh, we're just going to like ask this computer a question and we're going to immediately get all our answers. And then we quickly realized that it's good at certain things, you know, starting a song or maybe setting an alarm for cooking or, you know, various simple applications, but it, um, but it makes mistakes. You know, it's, you know, some of it is, again, more maybe a security thing, like you know, your four-year-old ordering, you know, lots of expensive things on Amazon accidentally. Um, I think the question is, um, what's the role of this technology and how it affects UIs? Like, are we gonna, are all our UIs gonna become a single text box where we type in what we wanna do and it just magically does all the work under the covers? Well, that would make it much, maybe faster to develop applications if you don't have to develop front ends ever. Um, but then if you're a power user, is it actually faster to like, you know exactly which button to click, is that actually a faster UI to, to have a conventional one, or will we have both, some sort of a hybrid application where I ask a question, it sets up the software application, and then I run it. I think I think those are the questions that uh, it remains to be seen. And then if that truly is the future, asking questions via text, how do we measure that? How do we know that um, that actually is a more efficient interface? How do we know that people are getting what they want to accomplish faster, better? Um, because it's a very, very different um, user interface than we currently have. So, so I think um, yeah, those would be the interesting questions. And look, you've mentioned there some of the interesting questions. Just as a, as a, a last thought to finish on, you're here for a very small window, unfortunately. Yes, certainly. But uh, what have you seen so far that you think, oh, hey, actually, I might be here getting asked a bunch of questions being up on stage, but I'm going to take this away. That, that's an interesting thing out on the floor or in, in the conversations that I want to take back to my business. Well, look, I think the exciting thing about being in a conference like this is just the diversity of applications of all this technology from uh, these machines there that make matcha to um, you know, machines that are uh, doing a lot for the environment or carbon footprint. Uh, I, I, think, I think a lot about... I talk in our company a lot like, you know, we're not necessarily curing cancer um, and we're a SaaS company. Um, but if someone takes our products and, it, and I was talking to one of our customers in the, the ed tech field and they're educating the future and if we help teachers provide a better education to someone who does cure cancer, then we have some part of making the world better. So, so the question is, um, how do we as technologists apply this great technology not just uh, interesting business problems, but societal problems to, um, to you know, prove how we live long term. I think there's some really compelling areas out on the floor that you know are inspiring and you know, got me thinking about how we can contribute to it. Todd, it's been a pleasure to, see, to uh, speak to you. Thanks for giving up some time. Thank you.